News 4 celebrates Black History Month. Black history is American history. And so this Black History Month, we're bringing you with us as we travel through time, celebrating the people and the places who have made this country what it is today. And so we begin right here on Broadway. The Broadway revival of Entezake Shange's For Colored Girls Who Have Considered Suicide When the Rainbow Is Enough opens at the Booth Theater in April. But you can thank the New Federal Theater for incubating the famous play. The New Federal was founded by producer-director Woody King Jr. in the 60s and lives on West 42nd Street. King's love and dedication to the arts helped produce actors like Denzel Washington, Felicia Rashad, Morgan Freeman, Jack A. Harry, Samuel L. Jackson, Lynn Terman, and poet Amiri Baraka. The New Federal Theater, provoking and enlightening our collective history. Broadway was forever changed in 1959 by playwright Lorraine Hansberry. I suppose it's my own private sense of drama that makes that appeal to me. At age 29, she transformed the theater with A Raisin in the Sun, the first play on Broadway by a black woman, and the first by an African American to win the New York Drama Critics Top Award. Tragically, Hansberry died five years later. Soon after, her autobiography was published, To Be Young, Gifted, and Black. With his deep voice and commanding presence, Paul Robeson was often described as a Renaissance man. Son of a former slave, Robeson was born in 1898 and grew up in Princeton, New Jersey. A scholarship sent him to Rutgers University where he graduated at the top of his class and lettered in four sports. He earned a law degree at Columbia, but his passion was music, theater, and racial justice. He was one of the first black men to play serious roles in white productions, and his portrayal of Othello on the London stage earned him international acclaim. For years, he fought back against accusations that he was a communist sympathizer because of his outspoken views on civil rights and social equity. They call me Mr. Tibbs. Actor and activist, debonair and dignified, Sidney Poitier was a Hollywood trailblazer. The first African-American to win an Academy Award for Best Actor, he paved the way for African-American actors on the silver screen. It is a long journey to this moment. He played heroes in films like Lilies of the Field, No Way Out, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, roles that changed minds during the fight for civil rights. Amen. Just hold on and suck it. Academy Award-winning actress Hattie McDaniel was a trailblazer on and off screen. The daughter of escaped slaves, McDaniel made her name first as a comedian and blues singer. She was the first African American to sing on the radio and the very first African American to win an Oscar, taking home a statue as Best Supporting Actress for 1939's Gone with the Wind. I sincerely hope I shall always be a credit to my race and to the motion picture industry. So-called mammy roles were all that came her way. Despite criticism for accepting them, she played them with strength and humanity. You're gonna miss me, honey, some of these days. Off screen, she opened her home and wallet to struggling black actors and actresses. Forging a way for black talent in entertainment history, Hattie McDaniel is a pillar in our collective history. You know mom don't like old men. <laughs> no. Anytime you see me with my arms around an old man, I'm holding him for the police. <laughs> Known as the funniest woman in the world, Jackie Moms Mabley is a comedy legend. Born in North Carolina, one of 16 children, she found the stage when she ran away to join a minstrel show. Her career took off in the 1920s on the Black Vaudeville or Chitlin circuit, where she adopted the popular Moms character. It was her ticket to stardom, with a career that included 20 albums and countless TV appearances. She was also notable for being an LGBT trailblazer, a rare lesbian celebrity who was out. While traveling the world, the world-famous Apollo was her home away from home, and she's remembered with a prominent spot on its walk of fame. From Ma Rainey's Black Bottom to The Wire to a Different World, actor Glenn Turman has been entertaining us for decades. The Harlem native got his start at the age of 12, performing with Sidney Poitier in A Raisin in the Sun. New York is also where his other love, cowboy life, began. He shoveled the stables in Central Park so he could ride horses for free, and he's been a rodeo champion in his spare time. It's why he's a model now for Beyonce's Ivy Park fashion collection. During the Harlem Renaissance, Strivers Row was the place to see and be seen. The area of West 138th and 139th, between Adam Clayton Powell Jr. and Frederick Douglass Boulevards, is an architectural gem. Built in the 1890s, it became home to black intellectuals, politicians, artists, and the upwardly mobile in the 1920s. Hence the name Strivers, 
and it's still popular today. The National Register of Historic Places calls it the St. Nicholas Historic District, but it's known as Strivers Row. Drink the moment, drink it. In the world of fashion, Andre Leon Talley was an historic force. Raised in North Carolina, he rocketed to the front row, becoming the first black man to be creative director of Vogue magazine. Along the way, he worked with legends like Diana Vreeland and Andy Warhol, and was bureau chief for Women's Wear Daily, and mentored young black designers, models, celebrities, and journalists. Ever uplifting and empowering, Harlem native Susan L. Taylor personifies grace, elegance, and black pride. The powerhouse editor-in-chief emerita at Essence Magazine has long used her platform to showcase and inspire African-American achievement. She founded National Care's Mentoring Movement with the goal of ending the cycle of intergenerational poverty among black children. Journalist, best-selling author, activist, and entrepreneur, Susan Taylor is a proud part of our collective history. Ebony Magazine evokes visions of ultimate style, class, and success. Founded by John Johnson in 1945 to celebrate black achievement, while sister publication Jet focused on news, it's renowned for features like the Ebony Power 100, the annual list of the most influential black people. Today, after more than 75 years, Ebony lives on online as a digital publication still dedicated to moving black forward. We real cool, we left school, we learn like we strike straight. There is no doubt that Gwendolyn Brooks is real cool. In 1950, she became the first African-American to win the Pulitzer Prize for her book, Annie Allen. Born in Topeka, Kansas in 1917, her family moved to Chicago during the Great Migration. Her first book of poetry, A Street in Bronzeville, told the tale of her neighborhood. Brooks was later a regular in the Chicago Defender newspaper, a consultant in poetry at the Library of Congress, and an Illinois poet laureate. The extraordinary life and legacy of poet Maya Angelou was newly minted when she recently became the first black woman to be featured on the U.S. Quarter. It's a distinct honor for a remarkable woman. Born in St. Louis in 1928, she chronicled her childhood of racism and abuse in a critically acclaimed memoir, I Know Why the Cage Bird Sings, which launched her to national prominence. I'm a very hard worker, and I've been very blessed. With her eloquent, lyrical voice, she spoke of civil rights and justice. The respect and admiration for her only grew after she delivered the Inauguration Day poem in 1993. History, despite its wrenching pain, cannot be unlived, but if faced with courage, need not be lived again. In 2010, President Barack Obama awarded her the nation's highest civilian honor, the Medal of Freedom. Welcome to Harlem. Known for its renaissance and its rich history, Uptown is just oozing with culture on every street, every corner, and every stoop. Like this one here behind me on East 127th Street, which was once home to poet, playwright, and activist Langston Hughes. There is no name more synonymous with the Harlem Renaissance than that of poet and author Langston Hughes. He was born in Missouri and attended Columbia University. His books, The Ways of White Folks and The Negro Speaks of Rivers, his poem Harlem, which asked what happens to a dream deferred, and the simple story series all captured the essence of the time, the angst, the joy, and the fight for relevancy. His ashes are interred in Harlem at the Schomburg Center for Black Culture, and not far away, his home on East 127th has landmark status. Langston Hughes changed the world with his words. Author and essayist Zora Neale Hurston wrote once, I have the nerve to walk my own way, however hard, in my search for reality. She took us along on her journey of black womanhood, especially during the Harlem Renaissance. Born in Alabama, raised in Florida, Hurston was the most significant and successful black female author of the early 20th century, most notably with Their Eyes Were Watching God. Chances are. Chances are crooner Johnny Mathis has been at the heart of millions of romantic moments over the last 65 years. A star high jumper in high school, Mathis wanted to become an English and phys ed teacher and was even asked to attend the 1956 Olympic trial, but chose to come to New York and work on his first album with Columbia Records. The rest is history. He is the longest running artist at Columbia with 17 million in album and single sales in the US alone. Mathis and Denise Williams even sang the theme song to NBC's hit comedy, Family Ties. What would we do, baby, without her? Terrence Blanchard is a trailblazing trumpeter and composer. His opera, Fire Shut Up In My Bones, was the first ever performed by a black composer at the Metropolitan Opera. The Oscar nominee and six-time Grammy winner began his career at 18 
in the Lionel Hampton Orchestra and has composed 40 scores for films like Spike Lee's Black Klansman. The New Orleans native is touring and writing today. We'll have another opera at the Met in 2023, aptly titled Champion. In February 2006, Shawnee Davis raced into the record books as the first African American to win an individual gold medal in the Winter Olympics, icing the competition in the 1,000 meter speed skating event. His victory came 18 years after that of another trailblazer, figure skater Debbie Thomas. She was the first African American to ever medal in the Winter Games when she won bronze in 1988. He was the first. You know, he was the one that I looked up to. Before Tiger Woods, there was Lee Elder. He shattered barriers in 1975 as the first black golfer to play in the Masters Tournament. Elder learned the game as a caddy, the only way black people could play on many courses during segregation, and he battled racism as a pro. He paved the way for generations of golfers, including the young winner of the Masters in 1997. With dignity and grace, power and perseverance, Arthur Ashe was a champion on the tennis court and off. The Virginia native fought through discrimination and poverty to become the first African American to win the men's singles titles at Wimbledon and the U.S. Open, and become the first black man ranked number one in the world. A dedicated humanitarian, he also became a tireless HIV and AIDS activist after he contracted it through a blood transfusion. Tennis centers across the country are named after him today, none more famous than the center court stadium at the National Tennis Center in Queens. Road Warriors for Equality. Freedom Riders were fearless in the face of so much hate. In 1961, the group of black and white civil rights activists took bus trips through the South, protesting segregated bus terminals. Despite arrests and savage attacks by protesters, hundreds joined the cause, and the government ruled segregation in transit was illegal, a key step toward the Civil Rights Act of 1964. How long can we be patient? He was an organizer of the March on Washington, a fearless freedom rider, and chair of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But it was in 1965 that John Lewis truly stepped into history, crossing the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, armed only with unwavering conviction. Lewis was severely beaten on Bloody Sunday, but fought on to become a U.S. congressman and continue the fight for civil rights. In a fitting final tribute in 2020, his body was saluted on that bridge in Selma by Alabama State Police. Madam C.J. Walker is a business legend, the first woman to become a millionaire in America. The daughter of slaves, she built an empire in the early 1900s selling hair care products to black women. Incredibly, her products are still available with modern day formulas, but the same commitment to black hair. General Colin Powell lived a life of exemplary service. The son of Jamaican immigrants, Powell graduated from Morris High School in the Bronx and City College of New York. His military career started with two tours in Vietnam and ended with then General Powell being named as the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and later Secretary of State. He was the first African American to hold either position. Soldier, statesman, humanitarian, and trailblazer. In a city defined by buildings, Vertner Woodson Tandy is a towering figure, the first registered black architect in the state of New York, whose enduring works included Madam C.J. Walker's mansion in Irvington. But it's what he built in 1906 at Cornell University that was a true game changer. Tandy was one of seven founders of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, the first college fraternity for African-American men. It was a force in the fight for civil rights with members including Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Today, it has more than 185,000 members and 850 chapters around the world. Agricultural scientist, botanist, engineer, and inventor, George Washington Carver had a stunning mind. He made 30 different types of dye from the Alabama soil, came up with 300 uses for peanuts and 100 uses for sweet potatoes, including gasoline, instant coffee, and rubber. Born into slavery in 1864, his pursuit of knowledge led him to a professorship at Tuskegee University, where he taught and was a pioneer of genetic engineering. George Washington Carver invented new ways to make our lives amazing. Every time you safely navigate an intersection, you can thank Garrett Morgan. Until he applied his brilliant mind to street safety in the 1920s, traffic signals were only stop and go, and accidents were off the charts. Morgan changed the world in 1923 when he patented a revolutionary design, adding a yellow light. Trudy Haynes has seen storm clouds and she has seen sunshine. The New York City native is the first African-American woman to become a weather reporter. Haynes was bused to school, a fact that she says helped her understand the world. She got her start in weather in 1963 at a Detroit TV station. 
Returning east, she became the first black female reporter in Philadelphia. At 95, Haynes is still a working journalist, producing videos online. Trailblazer is an understatement in describing award-winning journalist Joan Murray. She was the first black woman reporter in television news. The Ithaca native started as a secretary at CBS, interested in court reporting. She worked her way up, becoming a reporter at WCBS. Murray did a stint here at NBC as a commentator on the show Women on the Move. Murray wrote her first book, The News, to inspire all to the field of journalism. Well, there you have it. From Broadway to broadcast journalism, the contributions that African Americans have made in this country are endless. And remember, it doesn't stop there. History is happening right now, and we're covering it. Just head to NBCNewYork.com slash celebrating black history for more. Kay Ingram, News 4 New York.